Normal computers work, uh, either there's power going through a wire or not. It's one or a zero. They're binary systems. Uh, what quantum states allow for is much more complex information to be encoded into a single bit. Regular computer bit is either a one or a zero, on or off. A quantum state can be much more complex than that because, as we know, uh, things can be both particle and wave at the same time, and the uncertainty around quantum uh, states uh, allows us to encode more information into a much uh, smaller computer. So uh, that's what's exciting about quantum computing, and that's what we're doing. Today, I'm going to show you some explanation techniques I learned from watching over 100 videos. At the end of this video, I'll show you a world-class explanation that combines these techniques. And you have skills that you can use in your daily life, regardless of your profession. We all need to explain how things work. On any given day, we are explaining things to our bosses, colleagues, employees, family, friends, country, or even the world. However, no one teaches us how to explain. We tend to go with whatever feels intuitively right. But as we'll see later, there is a huge difference between what feels intuitively right and what is best. And explaining something benefits you. When I can explain something well, I understand the topic more. So let's get started. First, I'll explain how I identified fantastic explanations and typical explanations. Next, I'll explain what I found. If you want to skip to the second section, here's the timestamp. To make sure this video is useful to a broad audience, I first shortlisted two dozen fields of knowledge. These included traditional academic subjects like maths and history, but also practical skills like personal finance and video editing. I then pick two or three questions for each topic that a high school or college student may ask. For example, what are logarithms? Why is Korea divided? What is an ETF? How do I change the color of an object in DaVinci Resolve? I made sure that I was familiar with some topics but unfamiliar with others. I then found two videos that answered each question. One was an excellent video defined as a video with at least 100,000 views, or a video from a channel with at least 100,000 subscribers. The other video, which I'll call a typical video, had much fewer views than the excellent video. Obviously, a video's number of views isn't a perfect measure of its quality, but I found that the excellent videos had far more positive comments and likes per view than typical videos. I watched both videos, and wrote down things I liked and disliked about each video. So that I could focus on the explanation itself, I ignored audio quality, video quality, animation, and special effects. After watching the videos, I looked at comments that viewers wrote, and added things that multiple commenters mentioned. Finally, I summarized the differences between excellent videos and typical videos. Here are the most frequently occurring differences. First, excellent videos break down concepts much more finely than typical videos. In fact, more than 90% of excellent videos give more comprehensive explanations than typical videos. Because this happens so frequently, and because in my opinion is the biggest difference between excellent videos and typical videos, I'm going to share three examples of excellent videos and contrast them with three typical videos. Skip ahead to the next difference once you've got the hang of it. So here's, here, I'm, I'm giving you a widget. Here's your widget. It's $10, this is $10, okay? You don't have money for it? You're gonna give it to you tomorrow. Why don't you just get this widget tomorrow then, when you have the money? You need it now? You're gonna pay me tomorrow, right? Okay, so I'm gonna front you $10 widget and you're going to owe me $10. So I'm going to have an account receivable for $10. You owe me. I, ha I have a receivable. Wow. In just 30 seconds, I learned that I have an account receivable when I buy something but haven't paid for it yet. 
Now let's move on to a typical video. So this video is about accounts receivable. And what is account receivable? This is an asset account which businesses set up to help them track amount customers owe to them. So when businesses provide service or provide products to customers before the make payment, businesses set up this type of account to help them monitor and also help them keep record of this details or this amount that customers haven't paid to them yet. This explanation is correct. However, it uses phrases like asset account and business, making it more abstract and complicated than the other explanation. And for our second example, let's watch two videos answering the question, how does Bitcoin work? What does it mean to have a Bitcoin? To get there, and to make sure that the technical details underlying the answer actually feel motivated, what we're going to do is walk through, step by step, how you might have invented your own version of Bitcoin. We'll start with you keeping track of payments with your friends using a communal ledger, and then as you start to trust your friends and the world around you less and less, and if you're clever enough to bring in a few ideas from cryptography to help circumvent the need for trust, what you end up with is what's called a cryptocurrency. In less than one minute, I've learned that Bitcoin is a ledger that can help record transactions among people that don't necessarily trust one another, because it uses ideas from cryptography. Let's see another video. Bitcoin is a protocol. Where email is a protocol for sending messages over the internet, Bitcoin is a protocol for sending money over the internet. The Bitcoin protocol defines the rules of a payment network called Bitcoin that uses a currency also called Bitcoin to pay computers around the world for securing the network. The software that implements the Bitcoin protocol uses a special branch of mathematics called cryptography to ensure the security of every Bitcoin transaction. The rules of Bitcoin protocol include the requirement that a user cannot send the same Bitcoin more than once and a user cannot send Bitcoin from an address for which they do not possess the private key. If a user tries to create a transaction that breaks the rules of Bitcoin protocol, it will automatically be rejected by the rest of the Bitcoin network. This explanation is a good explanation. However, it contains much more information than the previous video. I'm still learning what Bitcoin is, so it's a bit harder for me to simultaneously digest terms like protocol, private key, and the rules of Bitcoin protocol. So while this video snippet contains more information, I learned more from the previous video snippet. Let's move on to the third example, balancing chemical equations. This is an introduction to balancing chemical equations. We're going to talk about what it means for an equation to be unbalanced or balanced, and then we'll learn the process that you go through to balance a chemical equation. I want to start with a few examples that show the concepts behind balancing equations so you can really understand what's going on when you work through these kind of problems. We'll begin by looking at this chemical reaction. Hydrogen gas and chlorine gas combine to make hydrochloric acid. So this is how we can express this chemical reaction using words, and we often call this kind of thing a word equation. Now, we can use this word equation to write a chemical equation by taking each one of these things and writing the chemical formula for it, okay? So the chemical equation looks like this. Hydrogen gas, its chemical formula is H2. We have and the plus. Chlorine gas is Cl2. We get the arrow. And then hydrochloric acid, its chemical formula is HCl. Okay, now if I wanted to be really precise about things, I could put a G in parentheses next to each one of these to show that they're gases, but I'm trying to keep things simple for this video. Now, in order to start talking about equation balancing, which is the topic of this video, we have to look at the atoms in this chemical equation. 
we have to look at the number and type of atoms that we have on both sides of the arrow. I've got some diagrams here so we can do this visually, so we can actually see the atoms and how they recombine during this reaction. Okay, so we got a molecule of hydrogen gas. It looks like this. We got two hydrogen atoms, one, two. Then we got some chlorine gas. We got a molecule of that, two chlorine atoms, got our arrow, and finally a molecule of hydrochloric acid. So there it is, one hydrogen and one chlorine. Okay, so now we're gonna start talking about balancing equations and balanced equations. First thing that I wanna do is figure out whether this equation here is a balanced equation. So here's the definition for balanced equations. A balanced equation has the same number of each type of atom on both sides of the arrow. Okay, so keeping this definition in mind, what I have right here, is this a balanced equation? No. It's not. Here's why. On this side of the arrow, I have two hydrogen atoms. Over on this side, I only have one. Over here, I have two chlorines, and over here, I only have one. So this is not a balanced equation. We don't have the same number of each type of atom on both sides. This isn't a balanced equation, so we call it an unbalanced equation. Unbalanced is just the word for an equation that's not balanced. It has different numbers of one or more of the types of atoms on the two sides of the arrow. Okay, so this is currently an unbalanced equation. Now most of the time in chemistry, unbalanced equations aren't particularly useful to us, and we have to make them balanced before we can use them for problem solving or for doing calculations. So often in chemistry, we start out with unbalanced equations, and then we have to figure out how to balance them. So in order to balance this, we're gonna make a few adjustments. Here's how we do it. To balance the chemical equation, we change the number of these molecules that we have, and we find a combination that gives us the same number of each type of atom on both sides. Okay, it's a little bit like a puzzle. So it might turn out that to balance this equation, we need three of these and one of these and three of these. Or we might need two of these and two of these and one of these. So we play around with the number of each one of these that we have, finding a combination that gives us the same number of each type of atom on both sides. Okay, so take a look at this equation. Can you figure out what we need to do to one or more of these in order to have the same number of each type of atom on both sides. Well, here's what we do. We have two hydrogens here, two chlorines here, one hydrogen, one chlorine. So if I get another one of these, okay, if I have two of these, we'll then have two hydrogens here, two hydrogens on this side, two chlorines on this side, two chlorines on this side, and now this equation is balanced. Okay, so we've balanced the visual, the visual version of it. To balance the written equation, what we'll do is we'll put a two in front of the HCl here to show that we have two of these, and now the equation is balanced. Okay, so this is the combination, this is the combination of these things and these things that we need to have the same number of each type of atom on both sides. We need one of these, one of these, and two of these to end up with a balanced equation. This is amazing. He went through things step by step. By going through the definition of a balanced equation, I know why the equation isn't balanced. Then he tells me that balancing equations involves changing the number of molecules in the equation. It then becomes clear why I need to add in another molecule of HCl. Let's look at a typical explanation. Balancing equations is a subject area that a lot of chemistry students struggle with, including myself when I was first learning this. One of the issues with balancing equations is there's not a lot of theory to it, but there is a lot of practice. The concept is simple enough. Everything in has to equal everything out, but doing that in practice is not always as easy as it looks. With this video, I'm going to talk through some of the tips, some of the tricks um, that I picked up just from doing an awful lot of these. So let's have a look. If I have a reaction like this, methane 
reacting with oxygen, a combustion reaction. And if we've been studying chemistry, we know that if you burn a hydrocarbon in a plentiful supply of oxygen, you'll get your two products. Your complete combustion gives carbon dioxide and water. So we have the full reaction here. And all the formulas are correct. H2O is water. It's always H2O. Carbon dioxide, CO2, O2 for oxygen, CH4 for methane. These are the chemical formulas, and they cannot change. I can't change any of the small numbers. The little numbers are fixed in. Notice that he starts off with a more complicated example, making things a bit more difficult to understand. So this has to balance because we've got an issue here. I've got one carbon going in and one carbon going out. That's not an issue. But four hydrogens going in and only two coming out. I've got two oxygens going in and three, one, two, three coming out. And that's the issue. Everything in has to equal everything going out. This is the concept of the conservation of mass. He says that everything going in has to equal everything going out. But this definition is less precise than the other video. So I don't change the formulas. I can't change water. If water becomes H2O3, for instance, well, it's something else. It's not water anymore. The formula is fixed. But what I can do is change the amount that I put in or out. So for a chemical reaction, I think of it a bit like a recipe. If I was making my favorite food, rice. So if I make rice, the right way to make rice, at least when I'm making it, is I get the same mug, the same cup of rice, and I fill my cup with rice. Now, if I want my recipe to work, I use the same cup, but I fill it up with water, two cups of water. So one cup of water needs two, one cup of rice needs two cups of water. And that's the recipe. In chemistry, we don't call it a recipe, we call it a ratio. But that's the same idea, recipe, ratio, my one cup of rice to two cups of water. But say I'm having friends around, say I've got guests coming and I need two cups worth of rice. Well, now my two cups of water is not going to cut it. I'm going to need four cups. But that's okay because the recipe is still the same. For every one cup of rice, I need two cups of water. So two cups of rice needs four cups of water. And this is how a ratio works, is that no matter how much I scale it up or scale it down, I have to have the equivalent amount of the other ingredient, the rice and the water. If I check my cupboards and I am low on rice and I only have about half a cup of rice, then the amount of water that I'm going to need is one. So my same one to two ratio, one cup of rice to two cups of water, still works if I have half a cup of rice and a full cup of water. So my recipe maintains my ratio. And that's what's happening in a chemical equation as well. So I just change the amount that I add to make sure this works. It's a bit harder to understand the relationship between the analogy and the equation he's trying to balance, especially since the example he gave wasn't as simple. It makes sense to think of, even if you don't draw it out, but at least have it in your head, a barrier between the reactants and the products. My reactants are on this side of the arrow, my products are on that side, and everything in has to equal everything going out. So my stock check, my inventory check, I've got carbons, I've got hydrogens, and I've got oxygens going in. So that means I must have carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens coming out. So why one carbon in equals my one carbon out. One and one. Okay, this is looking okay. And okay, right, here's our problem. I've got four hydrogens going in and only two coming out, two oxygens in, and three coming out. So this is where I can start to change the recipe to make sure that this is going to work out. So my four hydrogens in 
I've got to change it so it's four hydrogens coming out. Well, I can do that if I double the amount of water that's coming out. So twice as much water for the one methane, so the CH4 gives me now four hydrogens coming out if it's two waters. And that can change this one here. My hydrogen out is now four. So one carbon going in, one carbon coming out, four hydrogens going in, four hydrogens coming out. All right, this is working out. And now my oxygens, I've got two coming in and three coming out. Ah, but no, my three has changed as well because I had the two from the carbon dioxide and I've also got the two now from this water because I have twice as much of everything here. So two times two gave me the four hydrogens and the two oxygens as well. So one, two, three, four. So I have my four oxygens coming out. So now I can change the recipe on this side to accommodate the fact that there's four coming out. I need four going in. So what I could do is put a big two in front of this O2. So then two times two gives me four oxygens. And there we go. We have a balanced equation. One carbon in, one carbon out, four hydrogens in, four out, four oxygens in, four out. I balanced my equation. In all three cases, the fantastic explanation moves more slowly than the typical explanation. When you try to teach something, you're already familiar with it. Hence, you may create an explanation that's suitable for people that are already familiar with the content and just need to be reminded of it. However, your explanation may be too complicated for people who have yet to learn the content. So before you explain something, ask yourself, can I explain things more simply? One good technique is to start off with the simplest example or framework you can think of and guide your listeners step by step so they fully understand it. It's always easier to walk slowly than to run fast. So try to simplify your explanations again and again. Stop only when your target audience wouldn't want you to simplify things anymore. Simplifying explanations doesn't necessarily mean making them lengthier. It means explaining each step clearly and concisely. Here's a second big difference. Excellent videos explain high-level concepts underlying a principle much more often than typical videos. We've seen this in the Bitcoin videos. Now let's take a look at how high-level principles can help us understand a key biological concept, transcription and translation. Hey, it's Professor Dave. Let's talk about DNA transcription and translation. Now that we understand the structure of DNA, it's time to understand exactly how this molecule codes for a particular organism. How is it that a single cell containing a specific set of genetic material will result in the development of a fish or a cat or a human? To understand this phenomenon, we have to learn about transcription and translation. This is the collective process by which the genetic code is read by enzymes in order to produce all of the proteins in an organism. Even if I stop watching the video here, I know that transcription and translation is the process by which an organism produces proteins. Moving on to a typical video. Genetic transcription and translation is pretty involved and it requires several players, DNA, messenger RNA, ribosomes, and transfer RNA. DNA, of course, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and is found as a double helix in the nucleus of the cell. DNA contains the genetic material that runs all processes in the cell. Protein synthesis begins with a process called transcription. The DNA code is transferred to messenger RNA in the nucleus of the cell. RNA polymerase creates a messenger RNA strand using the DNA as a template. This new messenger RNA moves through the nucleus to the cytoplasm. Messenger RNA associates with the ribosome subunits and an enzyme in the cytoplasm activates its transfer RNA by attaching a specific amino acid to each transfer RNA. I'll stop the audio here, as the rest of the video just describes what happens during transcription and translation. 
I would have understood this video better if it had explained the purpose of transcription and translation. If someone asked me what's the purpose of transcription and translation, I wouldn't know how to answer them if I only watched this video. Even when you're teaching practical skills like issuing invoices, explaining the underlying high-level principles can help. A normal business transaction involves two parties, a buyer and a seller. The seller provides goods or services to the buyer and in return, they want to get paid. This is a transaction, so that's the whole point. So the buyer owes money to the seller. But how much exactly? And what specifically are they paying for? And how long do they have to make the payment? To answer all of these questions, the seller sends them an invoice which sets out all of this information. So the buyer knows what they owe, they've got an itemized list of all of the goods and services that they're paying for, and they know the terms of the transaction. They're happy, so they send the money to the supplier and the transaction's complete. Knowing why invoices are used helps me understand when to issue invoices. If the underlying principles are difficult, Try using an analogy. If you need an analogy to help you visualize this, then you can think of debits and credits as heads and tails on a coin, since there are equal and opposite sides to every transaction. In the world of finance, money doesn't magically appear or disappear. For money to go to one account, it has to come out from another. When you explain the high level principles associated with a concept, you help the listener understand why something is done. When listeners understand why, they'll remember things more easily. They'll also have a deeper understanding of the subject, as opposed to just remembering facts about the subject. Third, it's also useful to explain common misconceptions and answer common questions. When should I invoice? Invoices are most commonly sent out after the goods and services have been provided. However, they can also get sent out before, depending on what's been agreed between the two parties. However, the accounting treatment in each situation is different. Here's a really common mistake I gotta tell you about. When people are first learning this stuff, a lot of the times they'll say, hey, I have a simpler way to balance this. Here's how you do it. Get rid of this two here, get rid of this two here, and then just put a little number two right under this O here. Now you have H2 on this side, H2 on this side, O2 on this side, and O2 on this side. It balances perfectly. Yeah, but unfortunately you can't do that. These numbers here, we call them subscripts. You can't change them when you're balancing an equation. They have to stay the same. And here's why. In this equation, we're talking about water. Its formula is H2O, and this is what a water molecule looks like. If you put a two here, we're not talking about water anymore. We're not talking about H2O anymore. We're talking about a molecule like this with two oxygens and two hydrogens. This isn't water. This is now a compound called hydrogen peroxide. By answering common questions, you strengthen the listener's knowledge. Debunking misconceptions makes sure the listener knows the right things. It's almost as if you've expanded the listener's brain and removed impurities inside. Let's see what happens when all these techniques are used together, along with icing on the cake. And by icing on the cake, I mean enthusiasm. I'm going to put on, to finish my definition, I'm going to put on two more words. That's it. Just two more words. Okay? And I'm just going to use, as best as I can, the language we've already developed, right? Because we just established what adding and subtracting is, right? Yep. Okay, this is coming on to what Kaval was mentioning, okay? Multiplication, multiplying, I think the simplest way to understand it is it's repeated adding. That's all it is, isn't it? Come on, think about it, right? Example, okay. Uh, three times five. What is three times five? Of course you can start to talk about factors, you can start to talk like an area or that kind of thing, but really what it means is, well, it's three, and then you add three again, and then you do it again, and you do it five times, right? So you are putting together, you're adding on five sets that are all the same size, three, namely. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Well, if I'd written it like this, then it would, right? I know we tend to think of these as the same, but they represent different ideas, right? Like, you know, the fact that multiplication is commutative 
is not immediately apparent because not all operations are, right? So, anyway, okay. So therefore you can probably see where I'm going to go for division. It's, it's repeated subtraction. But it's a little different. It's a little different. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's an ATM machine. Okay, so it works a little bit different to this. Okay. For instance, if I said 15 divided by 5, what does that actually mean? Why, in what way is it repeated subtraction? Minus five, 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 what, you, what it means is, how, how many times can I subtract 5 before I have nothing left? Okay? And the answer is, well, I shouldn't say equals. I can do it three times. I can do once, twice, three times, right? And that's when I have nothing left in my set. Okay? So that's why three times, that's the answer. Okay, now, now you can see why I had to establish this, because that's going to be our gateway to think about what this means, right? Division by zero. Okay, so, example. Okay, let's consider what is one divided by zero, all right? So if I take this basic, basic, basic definition, right? It's, well, how many times can I take away zero? And you're like, well, well, I can take away one zero. I can take another. I still haven't, I still haven't got to my set which had nothing in it yet, right? So you notice, aha, uh -huh, there's three here. How many here? Answer, answer, infinite, right? Or infinity, okay? So you might think, okay, so does it seem fair to say this? Okay. Now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push further on this a little bit, right? Because one of the ways that mathematicians solve problems like this is we say, well, okay, you got a problem, here's one way to approach it. Let's approach it another way, okay? Because, you know, you guys actually know a lot more about division. You know that it's more than just repeated subtraction, okay? So for instance, let's consider, let's consider these. Let's consider these numbers, okay? One over one, one over 0 0.1, one over 0 0.01, Right, and I can I can keep going. Okay, so there we go. No prizes. What's it equal to? Four one. One divided by point one. It's ten. One divided by point oh one. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. So you can see where this is going, right? So now this is a different kind of argument, but this if it kept going. It seems reasonable to say, well, yeah? Now this is interesting. I've approached the same problem from two completely different angles and I've got the same answer. Okay? So this seems promising. Seems promising. But there's a problem. It's a big problem. Okay? And the problem is, you know, this game, right? This game that I played here with one divided by something and then divided by other things and so on. I can play it with other numbers too, can't I? For instance, I could do it with 2. Right? 2 over 0.1, 2 over 0.01, and so on. Right? Now, all of your numbers, right, they're going to be twice the size. You're going to get 2, and then 20, and then 200, but they're tending toward the same thing, right? They're tending toward infinity. So, that means, this is where this is going is 2 over 0, right? So, apparently, 1 over 0 is equal to infinity, and 2 over 0 is equal to infinity, right? It's like, well, if you have, if you have these two things divided by the same, they should be, they should be equal, right? Hmm. Now, you see, the reason why it was so important to go establish this, right, is that you can see, this is not just playing a game. We've broken, not just rules we decided or invented, right, but something which we knew to be fundamentally wrong. Here's one. I should put it in this hand, sorry. Here's one. And here's two. And they are not the same. Right? They are two sets and they are of different sizes. So this is this is wrong. This is wrong. It can't be. Okay? Which means that this can't be, which means that none of that is true. Okay? Therefore it's undefined. Now, okay, so then comes the question. Well then, okay. We call it, we call it, right? undefined but why do we call it that 
Is it just because it's like, well, I don't, I don't know. Okay, and I'll show you why. I'll show you why. Let's come back to this. Okay, let's come back to this. <clears throat> okay. Now, I approached it from, from this angle, and I was heading from, you know, this bigger number, 1, to point 0.1, point 0.01, and I was getting towards 0. That's the way I did it, right? I approached it. Now, there's other ways to approach 0, you know. You don't have to just come down from 1 towards 0. You could go, for instance, from minus 1 and go up towards 0. I can do that, can't I? 1 over this, 1 over this. I'm still approaching 0. I know I'm still going to get there. Minus 0 0.001 and so on. I should still get to 1 over 0. Okay, but what happens? Minus 1. Minus 10. Minus 100? Minus 1,000? Where's this going? This is not going to infinity. It's going to negative infinity. Okay, now, this is where we get to the crux of the issue. Okay? Undefined. Why do we call it undefined? I used to think, you know, you, you get your calculator out and you punch it in and it's like math error because, you know, because it's un undefined. You look it up on Wikipedia. You're like, are, are mathematicians just lazy? They're like, oh, well, I don't know what it is. We'll just not define it. No. In fact, undefined, it's undefined because it's undefinable, right? There is no number you can pick that makes sense. Right? Because, you know, you put it this, and some other guy will say, well, but I can make it equal this, in exactly the same way you did. Right? So there's equal sort of um, bidders for the crown of what 1 over 0 is equal to. Yes? Isn't it like, because if you graphed it as a hyperbola, then it would never, because it never touches 0? Right. So you, okay, so, so, so this stuff here, right, you can do it visually, right? You've got this, right? This is what we started with. Started at 1 over 1, which is like here, right? And then we decrease the value of the denominator, 1 over x, right? So we were going this way, and off we go up to infinity. But you guys know what the other side of the graph looks like, right? That's the other side of 1 over x. And off it goes down to negative infinity, right? So it's like, where am I going? Well, the answer is, I can't be going anywhere, right? Because it doesn't exist. That's right, that's right. The technical way of saying this is, the limit does not exist. Okay. So it's undefined because you can't define it. It's not just because we haven't worked out what it's equal to yet. It's because we tried to work it out and you just get completely random things. Okay. So that's why 1 over 0 is undefined because it can't be defined. I hope you use these techniques to make an impact on the world. If you've watched this far, I hope you can leave a comment with a teacher emoji. You mean a lot to me.